get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, uh, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm going to introduce today's guest, um, Robert Wallace. And, you know, when we, when we first got started and we're talking, you were saying, Robert, um, by the way, I was at the Capitol building yesterday when it got stormed. So I'm like, well, we should, we need to definitely talk about that because this is unprecedented times we're living in. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Robert properly in a second, but we're going to talk about his experience there. Um, and just to let you know, everyone should check out other episodes of Inspired Insider. Um, I was talking to Shante Robinson with Chase, and we were talking about how black CEOs and leaders and founders are underrepresented. And she introduced me to John and Dr. Uh, Denitra Griffin, the largest black owned security firm. Wanda James, I had on a Simply Pure, who became among the first black owned dispensaries in the nation owners. And then Chris Gandy went from MBA to running Midwest Legacy Group. Um, so I'm excited. And and uh, Robert has an amazing book. And we'll talk about that as well. Before we do, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25, which I co-founded with John Corcoran. And you know, it's funny, Robert, John Corcoran was a speechwriter at the White House under Bill Clinton. Oh, wow. So he this really hit him hard. We were on the phone yesterday. And I was like, not that it didn't everyone hard, but I think it just he worked there right and it worked in the in the white house in government and he just i could tell this was really hit him to heart you know took took a a hit on him and i didn't watch the footage or anything like that at the time and he had and and um you know after watching it last night i just it was it's just appalling you know um but at rise 25 we help businesses connect to their dream relationships by helping you run your podcast. That's what we do. And because for me, Robert, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships, profile those people, the people I admire and want to learn from and spread the word like people like you. And I do that by having them on my podcast and spreading the message of what they do to everyone I know. Um, so if you are a business and you've thought of launching a podcast, um, it's so much more than just content. It's business development. It's relationships. It's content marketing. So you can go to rise25.com and find out more um, or email us support at rise25media.com. Um, I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Robert Wallace. As I mentioned, he has over more than 40 years of business experience spanning engineering, energy, IT. He has a, rag, a true rags to riches story that begins in the Baltimore projects amidst pro, you know, poverty and racial segregation uh, before overcoming the obstacles to establish three companies, Bith Group Technologies, Bith Energy, and Entre Teach. And he shared his innovative strategies for success um, in his books and workshops. One of his books is called Black Wealth. It's on Amazon, check it out. And a few of his clients include Bank of America, uh, Dartmouth College, IBM, uh, Salvation Army, NIH, Toyota, Verizon, University of Pennsylvania, and many more. Robert, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Nice to be here, Jeremy. This is when I stopped talking, and this is your show. So, um, you were why were you at the Capitol Building, and, and what what happened there? So like from I, your experience, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, at the Capitol Building per se. I was in Washington D.C. Oh, got it. Okay, uh, yeah, and because I'm in D.C. a lot for business. We do a lot of work with the government, and uh, so I was there. And um, it was a chilling uh, experience, to say the least. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember uh, 1968 in our nation, right? That year where they assassinated Dr. King, they assassinated Bobby, Bobby Kennedy, the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, um, you know, I'm old enough to remember those events and that time in our nation's history. Um, and I remember how I felt in 1968. Well, what I felt yesterday in Washington surpassed that. Um, this is something that our country needs to pay attention to. Um, I think we've got an element in our nation who is prepared to use violence um, and hate to um, to 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 um, to gain back whatever power or control they thought they may have lost 
And this is a wake up call for this nation. And and I and many others um, feel very compelled to get that message out to people. I mean, it was really and there were many, many feelings, Jeremy, around this. But the one that really struck me the deepest was when I was when my my children called me, said, Dad, are you OK? You and mom OK? And my one of my children, I have five children, four boys and one girl. And they're all adult, adult children. And they said and they said, Dad, you know what? What struck me was how different the reaction is from the the police. He said, here are, here are men who are uh, starting an insurrection, who are physically overpowering the the capital, the, 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 the center of our democracy, and physically and violently taking it over, walking into the capital, going into the offices of our, of our leaders, right? And then walking out and high-fiving one another, and no one, no one's getting arrested. Yet, you know, black and brown and young kids can protest, you know, the mistreatment of, of people in America and get locked up by the by the droves. And, and it just the contrast in the eyes of my children. I said, Daddy, why do they treat us so differently? And so I, and so I think that this there's a lot of uh, pieces here, Jeremy, that I think we need to pay attention to as a nation. It's, it's really sad. Robert, when I was watching the news last night, um, and even one of the correspondents was basically asking the the people that were on site and saying the same thing you just said and saying, you know, there's people there taking selfies with yes. the police, right? And would that happen if this was a Black Lives Matter protest or, you know, you know, in the same, right? And they asked the correspondent that, right? So absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean, Jeremy, this is a this is this to, to me and others like me, this was the epitome of, of white privilege, right? I mean, you where you can where you can physically overtake our capital, our, our Congress, right, by with violence, right, and not pay a price, right? How 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 can this be? And yet when kids go out, I was when the George Floyd protests were occurring, I was out there when probably one of the older people out there marching with these young people. And I saw how the, the police dealt with us in that regard. And we weren't even violent. We were just, pro, we were just uh, marching and protesting. These are men, primarily men, men and women, but who were violently overpowering the police, right? taking over the Congress, and nobody gets arrested. I mean, there were a few people who were arrested through the 12 people. And I've been in, in, in nonviolent protests where people are, are, are locked in, put in buses, handcuffed, and taken away. It's just the just the hypocrisy, starting with the president, the, the hypocrisy of it, and then the Republican Party, the law, the, the supposedly law and order party, right? To see this and then to say nothing and do nothing, I think it's a wake up call for our nation. And I don't think it's going to end here, Jeremy, unfortunately. I think that President Trump has set in motion a, a force in our society. That, that, that genie is out the bottle. And he he can't even if he wanted to, and he doesn't. But even even if he did, he can't put it back in the bottle. So we as a nation need to wake up and pay, and pay attention. There's been too many wake up calls. That's true. You know, and this is one, Jeremy, that you know I thought if the Republican Party and these and these people, if this is not a wake up call for them, if this doesn't make them pause and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is out of control. This president has taken us down a wrong path. And I'm not trying to be political here, Jeremy, because I, you know, I've been a Democrat, yeah. I've been a Republican, now I'm an independent. So I know Republicans, Democrats, the whole thing. But this is about people. This is about leadership. This is about morality. This is about decency. If this is not a wake-up call for the Republican Party, then that party is dead. They are done. They have shown us who they are. My father used to say, you know, when a man or woman when they when they show you who they are, believe them, believe them. Mm. Where were you, Robert, in uh, 1968 when Martin Luther King got assassinated? What was that like for you at that time? Oh, my goodness. So I was a teenager and I was in Baltimore. And I'll never forget, Jeremy, uh, I'll never forget when they when they came on. We're watching <laughs> watching black and white TV. Jeremy. <laughs> you mean, I'm not sure how old you are. <laughs> Black and white TV, right? And we're watching the, the TV and the special report comes up that Dr. King has been shot, right? And then later on, it comes out Dr. King 
has been assassinated. He is, he is, he is, he's, he's dead. Right. And I remember that time as a young teenager, right. Turning to my mother and father and saying, and saying, mom and daddy, why, why does, why does America hate us so much? Mm. What, what did we do to yeah. make them hate us so much? I mean, here's a man who preached nonviolence, love for humanity, and they kill him. So mom and daddy, what does this mean? What does this mean? And so if for me, Jeremy, it was. But that's a, looking as a parent now. Yeah. Like that's, that's first of all, just a depressing question that you even have to ask it. And second, that's a, that's a tough question as a parent to answer for your kid. Right. So yeah. what did they tell you? But even, well, you know what I, I tell you, I, I think my father realized, Jeremy, in the moment that this was a critical, he need to answer this question for me and my other brothers, five of us in my family, five boys, that he need to answer this question in, in a very deliberate way. And daddy paused for a moment and then he said something that really helped us to put this all together. He said, well, son, it's like this. He said, he said, in America, You've got you got he said you got you got white people who are good and some who are bad. He said you have black people, some of them are good, some of them are bad, and that's just how it is. So he said, son, your job is to is to is to seek out the good in people and defend against the evil, because you're always going to have good people and bad people regardless of color. He said, and my father said, you know, son, there's some there's some good white people and there's some good and there's some bad white people. There are good black people and there are bad black people. So you need to you need to, you know, as you go through life, you know, figure out who they are and then, you know, make your decisions based upon that. Robert, what did you want to be when you grew up at that time? Well, you know what? I came from a family. I didn't come from. We, I mean, we didn't have any any entrepreneurs in my family. My mother was a janitor. My father was a laborer. Uh, my grandfather, Grandfather Carey, worked on the railroad. He was a, a, a sleeping car porter, um, and he helped to create the first African American Union in America called the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Wow! Um, and so that was my foundation. Um, but I lived in the community where there were, were business people who, uh, unfortunately, were not African American people. But I, but I admired them in terms of what they were able to build. And as I looked at them and what they were doing, and I always aspired, gee, I want to do that. I want to have a business. I want to be able to help people um, to make their lives better. I want to be able to make money and create wealth. And so that became the basis of my, of my, my interest um, in, in, in technology and in, and in business. And it helped me to, to build my businesses with that motivation. And I was mentored by many of these men. They're primarily men. I was mentored, I was mentored by many of them, you know, Mr. Pressman. Um, you know, Mr. Knight and Mr. Sanford, you know, these men, um, I guess they saw something in me and they just said, okay, what we're going to, we're going to teach you. We're going to mentor you. And they did. What were some of the, the best advice you got from them? Well, I think a couple of things, Jeremy. I, I mean, and I've always, and I've used these things in, in, in my life. Number one is, is, is you have to, to maintain the ability to dream. I think what happens in life, see, when you're young, you know, you, you, you're dreaming, you, you know, you're not bound, you're not confined, you know, by society, anything. You just let your mind just just roam and explode. Right. But as you get older, what tends to happen is the reality of the, the realities of life begin to, to, to put you in a corner, box you in. All right. And you start thinking what you can't do. All right. And then fear begins to increase. Because then you you're fit, you become more fearful, and I think what I teach, what I learned from these men is never lose the ability to dream. And tied to that is a lesson I learned from my grandfather and from my my parents about the fact that even though we're in poverty today, we don't have to be in poverty in the future. And in, in other words, my present condition condition does not dictate my future condition. So if I can change how I think. And which would change my actions and, and my and my how I spend my time, then I can change my outcomes in my life. I change my outcomes in my life, then I can change my reality and I can change who I am and who I can be. 
And I think that helped me a great deal because we started in poverty. I mean, we I can tell you some stories about, you know, scarcity, scarcity. of you food. Know, talk so, about that a little bit, because I mentioned, you know, obviously, um, you know, through the research, you know, growing up in the Baltimore projects and, and just kind of add some color to that. What what did that look like for you? Well, it was very vivid, Jeremy. I mean, very, very vivid. So we lived in a place that had, you know, a kitchen, living room, one bathroom, and had two two bedrooms, right? That was our house. And you can imagine, you know, packing. And there's seven people. Seven people, yeah. right? So mom and daddy in one room and five boys in the other. Um, we had cases where we had to sleep two or three kids to a bed. Um, we had situations where mom and daddy, you know, that they couldn't make, make enough money to pay the the heating bill or the electricity bill. So we would, you know, oftentimes had to go to bed wrapped in our, put our coats on and huddle in the bed to stay warm in the winter. Um, we, you know, sometimes you couldn't pay the electric bill. So we had no electricity. So we had to study by candlelight. And um, uh, it, it was just, I mean, I mean, I can, I mean, just in terms of the basics of like water, right? We, you know, when they couldn't, when you couldn't pay the water bill back in the old days, not sure how it is now, but they would cut your water off. You, you, you just didn't have any water. So we had to go to our neighbor's houses to borrow water to cook and clean with when mom and daddy couldn't pay the bill. And my mother and father worked real hard, sometimes two or three jobs. And so I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to go to bed hungry. I know what it's like to not be sure about tomorrow, or what, what tomorrow holds for you. I know what it's like to be abused by the police. I know what it's like. To, to wonder if you live to see to see tomorrow, so so I understand poverty. And I ran I ran for mayor recently in Baltimore City. Um, I came in second place. I was running I ran as an independent against the Democratic machine. Um, and one of the things that I was running on is how do we use entrepreneurship as the, as a tool to to change the economic inequality that has been built and baked into society in Baltimore and in most places, most cities now in, in our nation. Cause I recognize that until we did, until we fix that, the economic inequality in society, in our cities, we're going to, we're not going to change the violence. We're not going to change the crime. We're not going to change the hopelessness or the helplessness. And so my, my, my campaign was focused a big, a big part of it was economic empowerment of people in the cities. Yeah, I'm curious, Robert, um, at that age, um, when you first really experienced the racial inequality for the first time and you realized it, but the most understated thing you said, I think, is one, ba- I mean, you said there's no, wa- there's one bathroom with seven people, right? That's my gram. my, my dad is one of four my my grandparents you know very modest house uh, amazing love but there's one bathroom in the house okay exactly. and they have thanksgiving okay there's 30 people at their house and i every time we go over there for thanksgiving i'm thinking okay i'm a little worried there's one bathroom yeah with whatever 30 people i don't and they're small i don't know how that she produced the food out of that small kitchen but that was my concern I sure. don't know why. I don't know why, but but <laughs> understated is there's seven people. There's one bathroom. That's one bathroom. You know, yeah, exactly. So, um, anyways, the first time you experienced um, that, you felt that racial inequality. Do you remember? Like, is there a time? Oh, um, yeah. oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. It was. It was nineteen. I'm sure my age here now, Jeremy. It was nineteen sixty three. 1963. I think it was 63, 64. Um, I was a when I was young. I was a I was a big student of the civil rights movement. I mean, every newspaper article, every book that was written about the civil rights movement, um, I would I would read and I would study. And I think it was 63 or 64. I forget the year, but the but the year that they killed those three civil rights workers in Mississippi. Okay. It was Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. These three young men who had gone to Mississippi to register voters in that in that in that state, and um, and they and they killed them. The, the KKK killed them. And um, uh, I remember being in school, 
and having to pledge and to, to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for some. And I will say it that way. Mm. I remember my teacher saying, getting really mad with me, uh, 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 Robert, we don't, that's not right. Say it again, say it again. I will say it again. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for some. And she would get so mad at me and she would take me to the principal and he would tell me the same thing. You got to say it. No, and I would keep saying it because mm. I, said, I said, sir, ma'am, my reality is that that is not true. And until it is true, then I will say it the way that it is. And boy, I tell you, I, I create all kind of havoc. <laughs> and that, but that was Jeremy. That was for me because it was a lie. It was a lie. And when I saw these three, these three men killed by the KKK, when I saw people with dogs and fire hoses, and when I saw people that black people couldn't vote and that their lives were in danger, my grandfather came back from the war. He would, he would tell me these stories of how these black soldiers who came back from fighting for democracy to, 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 to keep democracy safe throughout the world, yet came back to their home, came back to America, couldn't vote. Couldn't hold, couldn't, couldn't tap into the GI, the GI Bill to to get money to buy homes and buy farms and start businesses because they were black because of the color of their skin. And I said, how can I, in good conscience, repeat this, say this, this, this oath? That's not true. And so until it is true, I told my teachers, I'm going to say it the way that it, it is in reality. And one day when that changes, then I will say it the way that you want me to say it. So I got, I, got, I got a lot of trouble for that. But, but, you know, at some point you say enough is enough. And that's how I felt like last, yesterday at, um, with, the, with the situation at the Capitol, right? Yeah. Enough is enough. When will good men and good women of goodwill and courage stand up and say, this is not right. This is enough of this. And we're going we're gonna to fight this. I remember... Um, again, and the, the March on Washington, 1963. And most people who study that, they will talk about Dr. King's famous um, I Have a Dream speech. And it was a very, it was one of the best speeches that they, that we, we've seen in our lifetime, right? But there was a speaker, there was a speaker before Dr. King, and he was a rabbi. And his name was Rabbi Yakum Prince. And Rabbi Yakum Prince was a rabbi, happened to be a rabbi in, in Germany, in, in Berlin, as Hitler was consolidating his power. Mm. And he saw, he saw firsthand the incremental dehumanization of the Jewish people. And he saw the violence perpetrated against them by Hitler and the Nazi regime. He saw it happening. And what he said in his speech in 1963, before Dr. King got up, and I'm going to paraphrase here. He said, you know, when I was a rabbi in Berlin, I saw appalling things. I saw the, uh, you know, the terrorism that was perpetrated against the Jewish people. I saw that, they, that their property and their, and their rights were taken away by the Nazis. I saw they were taken away to, to, uh, to, to camps. All that was appalling. But he said what was, more, what was more appalling than all of that was the absolute silence of the German people mm. who saw what the Nazis were doing to their neighbors and to their fellow German citizens and said and did nothing. And when I saw that chaos and that evil and that insurrection yesterday in Washington, D.C. My mom went back to 1963 when Rabbi Yaakov Prince gave that speech. And I said, where are the Americans who call themselves patriots? Right? Where are they? Where, is their, where are their voices now? Right? Carrying the American, carrying American flag and marching through the, through the Capitol does not make you a patriot. And you got these people who think that because they wave the flag and they and they talk this talk about patriotism and the Second Amendment and all that, that somehow they're patriots. They're not patriots. They're traitors. And so until people in this country 
recognize that as, as Rabbi Yaakov Prince reminded us in 1963, it is the appalling silence of, of the rest of the people that's more that that is what got him what made him more uh, more disturbed and i think that we as americans must have that same kind of anger righteous anger righteous indignation for this country to be what it needs to be yeah I, and um f- first of all thanks for sharing that robert and i want to talk about black wealth the book for a second but mm-hmm. But you're right, appalling silence. And I don't know if you knew this, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. And when you're talking about this, um, and he, you know, if you go to Inspire, if people go to inspiredinsider.com, my about page, there is a interview with my grandfather with the Holocaust Foundation on there. He's not alive anymore, but luckily they captured that wow. interview. And he talks about how they're, you know, would whip, whip people like dogs. Yeah, whip people like animals, you know, have them lay down on their stomach and whip them. And that's what that when you were talking, that's what I picture in my head. That's what this that's what it reminds me of. You bet. You bet. You You bet. Jeremy. Here's the lesson for us, Jeremy. And I bet your grandfather, if if he were alive today, he would tell you the same thing is that is that democracy and freedom is not free and it is not a, a, a foregone conclusion. So, 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 what happened to your to your grandfather, in 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 Germany and Europe during that time, and what happened to people in America and the civil rights movement, and what's happening now, that is is that those things, unless good people stand up and be counted, can very easily happen again. I mean, look at I mean, look at Jeremy. You know, the church in, in South Carolina, eight people were in church in a prayer meeting. Okay, killed by this crazy, this crazy right wing guy. The synagogue in Pittsburgh. I think eleven people lost their lives. Right. So, so this, this can, this is not. You, we can't sit back and think, oh, this can't happen again, or this can't happen in America. Well, yes, it can, and it will, unless good women and good men, people of goodwill and consciousness, and, and, and good and, and conscience, if they don't stand up. Like the rabbi said, and like I think your grandfather would tell you if he were alive today. And my grandfather told me he's passed away too. You got to be we of good people, men and women of good will have to be vigilant about freedom and about democracy. And if we if we lose that, then those who those it, it doesn't take much for evil to get root. The only way that happens is when is when good men and good women do nothing and say nothing. And I started yesterday at the Capitol and I said, where are the people of goodwill? Where are their voices? Where are their, are their actions against this, this evil, right, that I saw there? I mean, it's incredible. I guess I don't think it's a coincidence that we had happen to have this interview scheduled this morning, yeah. Robert. Um, thanks for the amazing conversation and stories. But Black Wealth, um, the book, okay, um, what is a favorite story? In, in that book that people should should know about. So and Black Wealth was started when I was a, uh, a graduate student uh, at the Amos Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth mm-hmm. and it was back in the 80s. And I began some research, right, because we were getting as an MBA student at, at Dartmouth at the time, we were getting this was just the, 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 the dawn of the of the PC and IT revolution. Right. So you had PCs. Mm-hmm just being created you got lotus one two three you got word perfect although you may not remember that jeremy that was the uh, one of the original word word processing softwares but all this this explosion of technology opportunity and we were blessed to have the many the, many of the leaders coming to our school to to lecture on you know these were some pretty amazing entrepreneurs but i noticed that none of them were people of color none of them were women and I said to myself, and I was, you know, in this, in many cases, I was the only African American in that in my class. There were not, not very many African Americans uh, at Dartmouth at that time in the business school. And I, and I said to myself, "This is this is not right. This is this doesn't feel right. There's something wrong." And so, because of that, I began doing research, part of my 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 grad, graduate work, to look at, okay, why do we not have more minority and women? entrepreneurs in, in this situation and, and what can we do to help change that and thus that became the the, the 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 basis of my research on black wealth and you know in that in that book i give a number of case studies 
of successful minority and women entrepreneurs who, overcome, who overcame amazing odds to go on to build amazing businesses. And I wanted to highlight those people. I wanted to highlight what they did that helped them be successful. And one of the things that I learned, the main things that I learned in this research, but there's one that I learned, one thing I learned, and that is the importance of building strategic partnerships and alliances. So as I looked at every case study of every successful entrepreneur that I, that I studied, I recognized a, a lot of commonality, but one of them was they were successful at identifying, creating, and building successful strategic alliances and partnerships. And if I can leave one lesson or one, one thought with your audience is that they really need to spend time mastering the art of building alliances and partnerships. And for me, it has served me in my own businesses. Now, Jeremy, everything I do, I have partners and, and alliances. I do mm -hmm. nothing by myself any, any longer. I used to when I was younger. But now as I've, as I've you know, learned and, and had more experience, I recognize I can do a lot more when I can find good people to partner with. And so that's part of my business strategy. Yeah. Robert, I mean, it's a, you have an amazing background. And I, I didn't mention it in the, in the, I mean, I mentioned your amazing background in the bio, but like you were engineering at Penn. Yes. Okay. And I think there's, there's something, I'd love for you to talk about mindset for a second, because, you know, if someone's parents went to college, you kind of have a mindset, okay, I could do this. And, right. and part of just doing something is believing you can do it. That's right. Right. That's right. So at that time, um, did you have a mentor? Did you have someone pushing you coming from, you know, living in the projects to university of Pennsylvania, um, engineering war, you know, um, you know, Dartmouth business school. At what point did you like, listen, my, my your mindset had to be different from, other people around Amen. you, I imagine. Amen. That's true, Jeremy. Very, very true. And there's so many examples I can give you, uh, Jeremy. But I'll give you. I'll give you a few. Um, so in high school, this is in Baltimore. In high school, so I go from junior, from middle school to high school. Now, now keep in mind, in middle school, I came up from K through through ninth grade. We were in a very segregated education system in Baltimore City. So all of my classmates were were African American. All of my teachers were African American women. That was my reality from from kindergarten to ninth grade. Integration comes to Baltimore. I go from that to an uh, all what was previously an all white high school. So now I'm I'm in an integrated school environment called called Polytech, which is a school for in, in Baltimore for kids who are gifted in math and science, right? Mm. So so I I go to school because my dad made me go to the school, right? So. I've always been Jeremy. This is probably. culture shock. Yeah, it, was culture. It, it really was. It really was. And you can imagine. And I then, picture that Norman Rockwell painting of the the little African-American girl. Yep. That's what I picture in this. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's right. That's how I felt, right? So now I'm in school with, you know, white kids. Not only, not only white kids, but kids from upper middle class um, economic, so, social economic in, 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 uh, environment. So I'm totally culture shock, right? But but I've always been a good student. I've always done well in school. And, uh, I, I mean, I just by God's grace, I, I just always got. A, I was an A student, and just did well in school. So I go to this, this this special school, and I still do well. I'm still getting A's. I'm still you know. But there were two professors there, and this one I want to share with you. The name was Mr. Knighting and Mr. Sanford. One was Polish American. Um, background and one was Jewish American background. These two men in my junior year at, at this high school pulled me aside, said, Wallace, we want to talk with you after class. So Jeremy, I think I'm in trouble. I think I'm going to get, you know, I did something wrong, right? So after class, they come to me and say, and say Wallace, well, they call you by last name in my school, in that school, Wallace. Wallace, we've been talking and we think that you are smart enough to attend an Ivy League school. Now, Jeremy, I'll tell you the truth. At the time, I had no idea what Ivy League school was. I had no idea what that was. I thought it was some kind of cologne you wear or something like that, right? <laughs> what? what? Ivy, Ivy, what? They said, trust us. They said, we think that you got what it takes and we're gonna help you. And these mm. white men, right? Now, now, keep in mind, I came from a all black school system, all black teachers to an integrated school now with 
primarily all white teachers, almost, not totally, but just pretty much. And these two, these two white men, one Polish American, one Jewish American, for whatever reason, Jeremy, they saw something in Bob Wallace and they said, this kid, we're going to help this kid. Mm. Pulled me up and they mentored me. And I said, Mr. Knighting, Mr. Sanford, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what this is. But if you tell me that it's important that I should do this, because we had built a relationship over my time in that, in, at that school, I trusted these men. I said, I will do what you tell me to do. And so we proceeded to apply to Ivy League schools. Mm. Uh, and that's how I got, that's how I got, because these men told me, made a, uh, planted a seed in my mind that said, we think that you're good enough or smart enough, right, to do X, Y, Z. And I believed them. And I believed them, Jeremy. And so because of that belief, then, like you said, then I said, well, gee, if they say I can do it, then, I, then, you know, then I'm going to do it. And so we did. And so I got to Penn, and there was another mentor that helped me at Penn. And his name was, was Dr. Jacob Abel. Never forget him. He was like a father to me. He was, he was head of, not head of, but he was close to being head of the mechanical engineering department at University of Pennsylvania. He was a Jewish American from Brooklyn. He taught me my first bit of Yiddish that I ever learned, right? And we would, and we would, and he mentored me through Penn and that engineering program and became like a father to me. Mm. But all through my journey, Jeremy, I've been blessed with these mentors that have come into my life. Dr. Abel and Mr. Knighty, Mr. Sanford. I mean, you can go down the list. Yeah. So that I gave a speech one time recently and they were talking about what I had done. I said, you know what? Oh, that's fine. But there's so many other people who deserve the credit better, more than me. And I listed them, started with my grandparents and my parents and my uncles, aunts and Dr. Abel, Dr. Mr. Knight and so forth. There's just so many people who helped me. So I can't take any credit. How powerful, you know, are mentors. And oftentimes they see something in us that we don't even know is there or even though we don't see ourselves. And I know that you I don't want this conversation to end. I know you have a a meeting. Yes. I'd love if you have a minute to talk about um, specifically. You've worked with so many amazing companies. Maybe um, Toyota or the CIA. What you did with them. If you have time for another yeah. story. If you don't, I totally get it. But um, well, you, yeah. let me do that, Jeremy. Then we can uh, hopefully we can we can chat again. So yeah. so so with Toyota. Toyota was one of my best clients. I love that company. That's why all my trucks and my, and my energy company and my business are all Toyota trucks. I love that company, right? Because they're, they're, they're smart, they make a good product, and they're decent people. So they hired me to help uh, their supply chain to implement some of my, some of my methodologies on creating alliances and partnerships. I've written a book. My fourth book is on alliances and partnerships. And, and I, I use that book to train executives and entrepreneurs on how a methodology for building alliances and partnerships. I've done this training all over the world and it, and it, and it works. And so Toyota had hired me to help with their supply chain, to help their businesses in their supply chain to use this, this, this powerful tool of alliances and partnerships to build their businesses. With the CIA, I was invited to speak with their with their executives because they were at a point where they wanted to bring in outside people um, to share their views on business and life and so forth. So I think it was 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 a, a very good idea. And so I was I was invited to come address them um, at the headquarters in Virginia. And it was so funny. I tell you a funny story. So so we're you know we're we're having conference calls, preparing for me to come down and get and deliver my 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 my, my comments, and um, and I'm and silly me. I I say something like, "Well, don't you have to do a background check on me or, or something before I come to the CIA?" And there was there was chuckling on the other end. They said, "They said, Mr. Walsh, you don't understand." They said, "Before we even pick up the phone to call you." We've done a very thorough background check. <laughs> so, like we already planted a camera in your house. Don't worry. Right, right, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so when the CIA says we've done a very thorough background check on you, and the guy came back and said, "And sir, you were squeaky clean." So I'm not sure what that means, but it was just so funny. It's a good thing. Yeah, yeah that's a good thing. <laughs> I love it. 
Robert, um, thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Thanks for, for you know sharing your amazing stories. And um, you can't see it right now, but I have a page up. You can anyone go to robertwallace.com. I'm at the robertwallace.com slash store page where you can see all your books. If you have questions about you know for Robert, he does do talk about some of the services that you offer. I mean, you do go in and you do talks to companies. What other things? do you offer um, so people can reach out uh, on those we things? Do, so we do We do a lot of work with corporate cor uh, with, uh, corporations. Um, we do something that we work in the area called, what we call intrapreneurship training, where we work going corporations and we work with their with the employees on how they can do their jobs in a more entrepreneurial way, even though they are in a corporation. And we call that intrapreneurship. Then of course, my 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 pro, my training program on how to build alliances and partnerships. We work with large groups and corporations and nonprofits and government, as well as I do individual um, mentoring and tutoring of, of of executives and coaching. Thank you, Robert. Everyone, check out robertwallace.com for more. And I appreciate you taking the time this morning. Thank you. God bless you. You take care. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, life's like a peach If you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand